morning and welcome to Living Hope Cathedral, a place of new beginnings. We are delighted that you have chosen to join us this morning. Please stand and join us as we continue to just lift up a praise unto our God. Thank you. Hallelujah. All right, can we give the Lord a hand this morning? Can we just say thank you, Lord God, for your loving kindness towards us. Thank you for your grace, your mercies, which are new every morning. We thank him today for his faithfulness towards us. This morning, we lift up a praise to our God, the rock in whom we take refuge. He is our fortress. He is our deliverer. And he is the horn of our salvation, our stronghold. And so this morning, as we lift up a praise, we're going to sing, Jesus, rock of salvation. Amen. Yeah. 
bless your name, we bless your name, Lord. We say, Lord, you're mighty. Hallelujah.
Jehovah is your name. Jehovah is your name. Say Jehovah. Jehovah is your name. Jehovah is your name. Mighty warrior. Mighty warrior. Great in battle. Jehovah.
Hallelujah. We give God praise. Could you give the Lord a hand? Amen. And what excites me when I reach to a holy place is not that I showed up, but that God showed up. And that he's a God who keeps his promises, his covenant for a thousand generations. When we actually declare the name of Jehovah, we are speaking about a covenant-keeping God. And that's who he is. He's a covenant-keeping God. He says even when we break our part of the promise of the covenant, he remains faithful. And that's who he is. And that covenant-keeping God is present with us. And every time you call his name, you are reminding him that he is a covenant-keeping God. How many of you appreciate the fact that you serve a God? Hallelujah, he keeps his word. Yes, lift up your hand, bless his name. Yes, declare to him, Father God, we bless your name because you are faithful to the very end. Hallelujah, you do not change your mind. That is faithful. You do not change your mind. If you make a promise, you're going to keep it. And we revel in that. We rejoice in that. Yes, our hearts are made glad because Jehovah, you are present today and that is to bless your people. You may be seated. God bless you. We thank you that you are here. But like I say, I am so excited that God is here. Amen. Could we just sing that quietly? Right there in your seats. Just quietly lift up that song. Let it. There it is. Not for me, not for the person next to you. Just remind your spirit, quiet your spirit by reminding yourself that he is a covenant-keeping God. Father, we love you. We love you. We love you. We praise you, Jehovah. Cathedral, a place of new beginnings. And I'm excited that you are here, and we're excited that God's presence remains and abides with us even now. May God continue to bless you. May He anoint your ears and open your spirits to receive His word. And may you leave better off than when you came. In the name of His Son Jesus Christ, I declare that over your life. Amen. Amen. And good morning, good morning, good morning. For a scripture reading this morning, I'll be reading from Psalms chapter 31, verse 19 to the end. And it says, Oh, how abundant is your goodness, which you have stored up to those who fear you, and work for those who take refuge in you, in the sight of the people of mankind. In the cover of your presence you hide them from the plots of men, you store them in your shelter from the strife of tongues. Blessed be the Lord, for he has wondrously shown his steadfast love to me. When I was in a besieged city, I had said in my alarm, I am out from of his sight. But you heard the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cried to you for help. Love the Lord all you his saints. The Lord preserves the faithful, but abundantly repays the one who acts in pride. Be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who wait for the Lord. And I know today there are those among us today who have been waiting for God. And maybe you, like the psalmist David, might have felt that because you were besieged, you were, you were um in a place where you didn't see a way out. He felt that God was not caring. He felt that God did not, um, that he was out of God's sight. Those were, were his exact words. He felt that where he was, God couldn't see him in that circumstance. And then he later went on to say, 
But indeed, God heard the voice of his pleas for mercy when he cried for help. And we are reminded today that there is no place or no circumstance where you may be where God, our Heavenly Father, is not aware because he hears, he sees, and he knows everything that is going on. And not only does he hear, sees, and knows, but he also cares. He's a father who cares, and he's a father who will respond to a heart's cry. So we can trust that even though we're in a time of a new era, a new pandemic is around us, we are, some of us might not have jobs, some of us might have lost our homes, there are different trials our jo um, and, and tribulations that are coming to us as a person, personally and also around the world. But we can know that God is hearing, he is seeing, and he is responding. So we thank you, Heavenly Father, today for your response and your care for your people. We thank you, O oh God, that though we may receive, may, may feel sometimes that we are trapped on every side and that we are besieged and that things are, are falling on us and that there is no response to our cry. We are reminded that as the Psalmist David said today, that when he cried out to you, you have heard. And so we cry out to your God today with our personal needs, O oh God. We cry out, O oh God, to you today for our nation, for our island. We cry out, O oh God, for against the crime. We cry out against the the illnesses that have befallen our people and we continue to ask you for mercy when it comes to this pandemic of the COVID-19, oh God. God, we want to thank you, oh God, that you are hearing our hearts cry. Yes. We are thanking you, God, that you are our comforter and you are our friend. And we are thanking you that there is no distance in prayer. And so even as we may be joining in via the Facebook feed, we are also thanking you, oh God, that our cares are also being heard because you said with two and three of us are touch and agree on anything that you are there in the midst. So that would be we thank you for your presence. We thank you that, that, that you are here, and we thank you that you are responding. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen. And, and amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand. Father, we bless your name. I always give the Lord a hand upon our request because we believe in a God who answers our prayer, and we have so many instances where he's answered our prayers before. At this time, I will also like to acknowledge our guests. We have a baby dedication, which we're going to do after I acknowledge the gifts, tithes, and offerings of God's people. Um, during this pandemic, we have created a touchless service as much as we can, um, except we are moved by the Spirit of God otherwise. And so during our givings, um, it's being done online. You can go to the church website or you can... Um, receive a text um, for the mobile app, but it's called Mobile Cars. Um, and if you go to livinghopecathedral.com, there is a page for your giving, so you can continue to give there. We do receive your givings every month, and it has continued for us to pay all of the expenses of the church as it become due. And so we have not been placed under any undue stress during these um, challenging times because of the generosity and caring of God's people. So give yourselves a hand as you continue to honor God with your giving. Both those, those of, of you who are present in person as well as those who continue to worship online. So we give God thanks for that. And because of that, I like to always pause in our service to lift up your offerings before God as the ancient priest in the Old Testament and to command a blessing over you. Uh, for those of you who would like to give after the service and you're not comfortable using online, you can do so as you leave. There's receptacles or offering baskets on the cross, and so you can um, place your offerings as you leave. But if you have it in your hand, you can lift up your hands before God as I lift up this offering that we receive through online giving, and then you can place it as you're leaving the service after the ministry of God's word. Father, we love you. We continue to acknowledge by our giving that you are first place in our lives. That is why we give to acknowledge our reliance upon you, our dependence upon you, and our trust of you, and thy great name and the words that you, you have spoken. You have said if you command a blessing for us, no one can change it. And we thank you for that confidence that we have in the guarantee provided by your holy scriptures. We continue to pray for the welfare and the safety and the health of your people. May they prosper and be, good, be in good health as your souls prosper. May they continue to grow in grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And may the world look upon them and know that they've been with Jesus. May their speech give them away in Jesus' mighty name. May their good behavior speak well of the name and the excellency of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray that you'll continue even now in this day to pour out your spirit upon all flesh. 
May our old men have visions and may our young men and women prophesy and rejoice in the salvation of thy great name. We ask for your favor and blessings upon your people as we continue to worship you in spirit and truth. And all God's people say, Amen, amen and Amen. So today we are so happy to be privileged to have a baby dedication and for those of you who have entrusted us during the season to do that. Uh, this is our ba first baby dedication during the pandemic and that's just for historical information. Um, Baptized uh, people, so we've continued to do that and I've also had the privilege of marrying people and so people are still falling in love and getting married during this time and as we see people are still being blessed um, with the fruit of the womb. So we're gonna ask um, the parents of Javon um, Nahim Walwin to stand at this time as Pastor River gets ready to read the scripture and then I will pray. So could all of those who come as godparents and parents for the baby, could you stand? Could the church give them a hand as they stand? God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Amen. Praise God. Today we welcome you as we bring before God today Javon Naeem Walwin Jr., as well as his parents, Caressa, Harris, and Javon Walwin, and those who have come as the godparents, we also welcome you. It is wonderful that you have decided to dedicate your child to God, because the scriptures in Psalms chapter 78, verse 4 to 7 said that we will not hide them from their descendants and we will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord his power and his wonders that he has done he decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel yet he commanded our ancestors to teach their children so that the next generation would know them even the children yet to be born and they in turn will tell their children then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. And that is why we dedicate our children to God, because we are encouraged that we are supposed to train them up in the way that they should go, so that when they grow old, they may not depart from God's word. And one of the ways that we train them is to remind them of God, what God has done for us personally, and what he has done through his scriptures. And therefore, they can get a personal faith for Jesus Christ when the time comes. And so today, the parents have come to give God thanks for their child, Javon, as well as to dedicate him into God's, um, to dedicate him to God and to acknowledge that they will raise him in the fullness of God's word. And so, Pastor Carl will now go ahead and take care of the next part of Amen. the service. So one of the things we want to acknowledge to you that you are following an ancient tradition and it's noble. Jesus Christ, after the eight day, was brought to the temple by his parents in Luke 2. And he was also offered to God as a child. But when he became of age, at the age of 30, um, he went to the river Jordan to be baptized by his cousin John the Baptist. And so in the evangelical church, um, we are faithful to dedicate our children to God and to pray God's holy anointing and protection and covenant upon the child. But we are also covenanting as parents and as the church to raise the child with the knowledge and the awareness of Jesus Christ as both Messiah and Savior. That when he becomes of age, he will make a profession of faith and be baptized by water into the family of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do we understand that? And so we are so happy that when you signal that desire to partner with the church here and abroad um, to raise your children in the fear of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the knowledge of God himself. So we give God thanks for that. We are also mindful that it takes more than parents to raise a child. And so at this time I'm going to ask the grandparents if they can get the anointing oil. They're going to go and get the anointing oil. It's going to have a little fragrance that smells of frankincense. And that was one of the fragrance given to our Lord Jesus Christ himself as one of his three gifts, frankincense, more, and gold. And so we're going to anoint him with the fragrance of frankincense um, and invite the aroma of the Holy Spirit upon him. And so I'm asking the grandparents to help me, also acknowledging that they play a very vital role in the life of the child. 
It's sad that today so many people tell grandparents and other parents after they've asked them to come to church with them, don't have nothing to say to my child. That's very sad because children should listen to adults. In the society where I grew up, <laughs> you had to listen to everybody um, who was in the church. So when you look around and saw um, people from your church, you tremble with holy fear because you realize that um, your parents had allowed them to also instruct you when it comes to the things of God and to godly living. At this time, I'm going to invite the church to stand with Javon, and I'm going to ask you to turn around. The child is sitting right there, and stretch your hands to the child. We believe there is no distance in prayer. We have prayed for people as far away as Atlanta and the far regions of the earth, and God has honored his word. Father, we love you. We thank you for the anointing of your Holy Spirit that is able to touch us where we are. We pray for the holy anointing of God to rest upon Javon in Jesus' mighty name. We speak a blessing over his life. We remind you that you are God who keeps covenant and you do not lie. We invoke the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. We pray that Javon will be raised with an awareness and knowledge of you through your word, that he will learn to trust in you, that he will learn to honor you, to walk before you in integrity and truth. And because of his fear of God, may you defend him on every side. We come against the spirit of lies and every adverse word that tries to speak fear into his heart. We cancel it and we cancel his as, as assignment. We speak only good concerning Javon in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray, Father God, that when he stumbles, you may hold him by the hand that he may not fall in Jesus' mighty name. I pray that you will protect him, Father God, in every area of his life. In the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ, in everything that he needs, you will supply. For great is thy name in your holy heavens. We pray, Father God, that the name Yahweh will be lifted up above his life, above his tents, above his doorposts, and above where he walked. Father God, that you will go before him and shine your light upon his life path, that you will guide him all the days of his life. And now we speak for your special healing over the life of this child. We pray that you will touch him by your holy hand. We command divine health to flow in his mortal body in Jesus' mighty name. We pray that everything that concerns his parents, concerns their hearts, concerns their minds may be eradicated and eliminated through the covenant of the Holy Spirit that touches his life and makes him well in accordance to Isaiah 53. We declare by your stripes he is healed to the honor and glory of God the Father. And now, Father God, I pray that you will bless him and you will prosper him as long as he lives. May you defend him on the right hand and on the left hand. And Father God, I pray that you will give him friends and may he know what love is, true love, because he knows your name. We pray all these things in all the name, but in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Give him a hand. How many of you want to help me sing? Don't sit. I am so glad that my Father in heaven tells of his love in a book he has given. I'm not a worship team, but I want you to sing. In the Bible I see this is the dearest that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. We're going to sing the chorus again. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. One more time. Don't sit. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Me. Give the Lord a hand for loving you. Amen. You may be seated and give God thanks that he loves us. Amen. So today I'm so honored to continue to teach you about bold living in tough times. But I'll be amiss if I don't take a few minutes of your time and my time to just acknowledge how God indeed blesses us 
And one of the things I want to do is to talk to you about how you can improve your standard of living. I know by the world's measure, most of us run through our minds. And when I talk about improving your standard of living, we check our mind as to the last time we looked on our phones, at our banking app to see what we have. We try to consider the cars we have in the parking lots and the, home, and the houses we left when we descended out of our driveway. But the Bible doesn't measure any of those things when it comes to your life. And so I want to speak to you today about how you can improve your standard of living because Peter talks to us about how you can truly live, how you can live a bold faith, how you can live a bold life in tough times. And all of us in this room can acknowledge that we are living in tough times. Amen? If you agree with me that we are living in tough times, just wave at me. There we are. Universal. We have unanimous agreement that we are living in challenging, difficult times. But God has blessed us and favored us. And what helps us to get through tough times is the love of family, the love of friends, and the love of people that he brings into our lives through the process of relationships. Some, some relationships more than others that grows into covenant relationships. And so we give God thanks for that. I just want to acknowledge and honor my wife. Some people may hear me talk about her all the time, but they don't know who she is, Dr. Eva Richardson. Could you stand? This is my wife. Glory to God. Yes. Uh, and she makes my life fun. She keeps me young. I was raised by a pastor, and I was very stuffy when I met her, very rigid very pious and she helped me to relax a little bit and to have fun so yesterday she thought it was fun to have me run around in Charlotte and Molly looking for stuff and when I first started I was a little annoyed but then as I did it I got happier and happier because I was a little, little like a little kid looking for gifts so I just want to acknowledge her and all those who helped her and then today and um, God brought a lot of people in my life it's amazing and most of them share the, f the fact that they were born in November. And how many of you know that great people were born in November? <laughs> My wife was born in September, so. <laughs> but there are great people born in November. Uh, like people like Sister Glenda, November 18, right? I got that right? There you go. Sister Glenda in the house. We have my good friend and elder brother James. Today is his birthday. Can you stand up, James? <laughs> I got it from the internet, and the internet don't lie. <laughs> the one thing I love about um, one thing I lo love about um, social media and all those things is when you keep forgetting your, even your own wife's birthday and your children, but it reminds you uh, that somebody's having birthday today. Then we have my good friend Aaron Roach. Is he in the building? Another November born. <laughs> you see all of that. Then we have Sister Chanel. She's all the way in Alabama. She was born November the 11th. Then we have both of my sons, don't try to do the math backward, but both of my sons was born in November. One was born on the second. Oh my God, I've got to get a God Street to jail. November 3rd and November 11th. So give God thanks for my two sons. Yes, Ricardo and Romani. They're both November born. So we give God thanks for that. We give God thanks for all of you, and I know that you are all special before God. I just was teaching you about great people are born in November. And, and I was born November 24th. That is Tuesday. And there's a story behind my wife keeping up a celebration yesterday for me. I've always... I don't want to make myself sound bad, but I've always complained about how everybody else in the family birthday gets kept up, but then Thanksgiving comes and then they tell me, oh, we had people over for your birthday. Not true. And I keep saying, nobody celebrates my birthday. And I always keep hearing, oh, Thanksgiving is because it's Thanksgiving. We had turkey for your birthday and they made it a joke till I got annoyed. I said, nobody remembers my birthday and I celebrate everybody's birthday. Um, but this year, she um, kind of makes sure it stood out. So I want to tell her, you outdid yourself. You outdid yourself. So God bless you. 
Thank you for listening to my heart's cry for the last 27 years. <laughs> it took that long. He said, I wonder when this man is going to preach. It's okay. You're in good company. And how many of you know the Lord has a word for you? Yes, he does. He never disappoints us in this house. He always has a word for you. And I'm actually trusting his leading and his anointing. I want you to relax because of what I'm going to teach you next. It's going to make all the difference in your life. And then I'm also very honored that my good friend who took me in when I was homeless and churchless, uh, he became a father to me, Dr. George Phillips and his beautiful wife. She makes him look good. Could you stand? <laughs> Give them a better hand in that. God bless you. Glory to God. I love you and the house loves you. I love you and the house loves you. And whenever the spirit moves you, whether I'm here or not, they have already received word, but their hearts are open to you to welcome you as I would welcome you, like a son. Could you turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter 3, verses 1 through 17? You know, the Bible tells you there's a friend born for adversity. <laughs> Go and look that scripture up. It's an amazing scripture because it tells us that God gives us friends for seasons of adversity in our lives. So I want to talk to you and explain to you what I mean about how we can improve your standard of living. 1 Peter 3, 1 and 17, how we can take seasons of adversity and hardships and persecution as this church that Peter was writing to and make them work for us. Or we can work them in spite of our circumstances. And so he begins with a very foundational a covenant relationship that is important to God and important to the church. And I just want to highlight that. The Old Testament begins with this covenant relationship. After God created man, the next thing he's speaking about is marriage, that it was not good for man to be alone. When Jesus Christ comes on the scene, he does the same thing. The first place he went where he demonstrated to the world his divinity and his miracle work and power was at the wedding of Cain of Galilee where he turned water into wine. And so we see that covenant relationships, especially marriage, which Ephesians 5 tells us signifies the relationship that Christ has with the church is close to the heart of God. And so Peter's writing to us, he says, Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that if any of them, meaning the husbands, do not believe the word, they may be still won over without words by the behavior of their wives. When they see the purity and the reverence of your lives, your beauty should not come from the outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self. It should be that of an unfading beauty, of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great value in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands, and like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her Lord. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Verse 7. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect. As the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life. If you start getting anxious about all his instructions, you're going to miss the beautiful part. I'm going to tell you when to underline. Here's the beautiful part. So that nothing will hinder your prayers. Finally, all of you, whether you're male, female, husband or wife, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate, be humble, 
Do not repay evil with evil. Do not repay insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing. Because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of our God is against those who practice or do evil. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats, do not be frightened, but in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be ready or prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Don't be argumentative. Keep in a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander, their untruths. For it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. So good morning again. We welcome you to Living Hope Cathedral. It's a place of new beginnings. And we believe it's a place of new beginnings because God orders our steps in his word and he will transform us into the image of his dear son if we dare trust him and respond like Peter to his word in obedience. Today we are discussing a passage of scripture that gives us so many practical ways, numerous ways that we can live out our faith in this present world. The apostle Peter writes chapter 3 in a way that makes preaching easy. I can almost just paraphrase or repeat the things that he has said, and it will resonate in your hearts and minds. His words are plain. They are straightforward. They are like bullet points, and we get it. It is impossible to miss what he's trying to teach us. And Peter wrote this letter to Christians who were suffering all kinds of trials. That's what I want to underline for you today, that as we listen to the word of God, this was not written to people on easy street, who was at ease, who was in the lap of Western luxury. These were people who were severely persecuted and mistreated. He said they were like slaves suffering at the hands of abusive masters. They were like citizens suffering persecutions from an oppressive country like men without a country. They were everyday believers who were suffering slander or untruths and mistreatments by those in their community who was hostile to their faith and the mention of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Peter makes it clear that good behavior, especially in the face of evil, that our circumstances shouldn't change who we are or how we respond, that we should not let the happenstance of life define us, but the Spirit of God that is in us, that compels us to do good, in the face of evil should be our defining moment. And he tells us something that is very interesting. He says that without words, say with me, without words, without words. Say with me again, without words, without words. And that is our problem today, is that the church has become all about the words. But Peter is saying to us that without words, we can win people to Christ. We can win others to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. How do we do that? And that is what I've come today to talk to you, that we begin to transition and move our living from just words to where it truly makes a difference, regardless of the environment in which we find ourselves. Peter is recommending ways that we can live to please God in the midst of a hostile environment that is contrary to what we believe, contrary to the gospel. But he's also saying to us that when we do so, we please the heart of our Heavenly Father, that it works for our good, and it raises the standard of living. Here's his words. Finally, all of you, 
should be of one mind, full of sympathy, towards each other, loving one another with tender hearts and humble minds. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate when people say unkind things about you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. That is what God wants you to do, and he will bless you for it. Peter's working so hard, and it's because it's important for the anointing of God to work in the midst of the earth. He's working so hard for unity. He wants to see unity in the church. He wants to see unity in our families and in our homes. He wants to see unity in our communities because God works when we come into agreement. And that is why the prophet Amos said, can two walk together except they agree? And then in Psalms 133, it tells us that the anointing of God is poured out over his servants, the prophets, like Aaron, the chief priest, and it runs down to the hem of his garments and flow into the congregation because of the corporate unity that has brought about people. And so we begin to see that the gospel of Jesus should bring an end to strife, should bring an end to arguments and divisions in the midst of us. He says the reason that you argue and you're divided is because you are fleshly and you have fleshly lusts. You're seeking out of a spirit of pride or, or self-serving to have the spotlight on you. But that is not the purpose of covenant relationships. It's not what you can get out of it, even if it's marriage or the church. It is what you can give. And so God is focused upon what you can give. And right in the midst of teaching us about suffering and mistreatment, he quoted Psalms 34, 12, and 16. Could we turn our Bibles to Psalms 34, 12, and 16? And as you begin to read it, you're going to say, wow, it sounds similar. <clears throat> and for Peter and Paul, <clears throat> whenever they were writing letters, when they talk about the Word of God, they were actually speaking about the old scriptures, the ancient scriptures. They were speaking about the Old Testament. And today you have like in churches where they make arguments about whether the New Testament replaces the Old Testament. But really, when these guys were talking about the Word of God, they weren't even talking about their letters because that was canonized many hundred years later. They were actually making reference to the Old Testament. Everybody gets that. And so then he wants to, to show you the support for what he's asking us to do, and he goes into a prophetic utterance by King David. And here's what Psalms 34, 12, and 16 says. If you love life, let me see the hands of all those who love life. That's me. Say, that's me. That's me. He says, if you love life and you desire good days. So let's, let's do another check. How many of you desire good days? Say, that's me. Oh, man, the preaching to this group is going to be easy. So I love life and I desire good days. He said, then I'm going to show you how to get it. I am going to show you how you who love life and desire to have a good and wonderful life can attain to that goal. And so he reaches back and he quoted the scriptures to lay the foundation for how those of us who love life, who has not given up on life or written it off, who still look forward to tomorrow regardless of how dismal it seems. He says, if you love life and desire good days, then keep your tongue from speaking evil and keep your lips from telling lies. Wow. Somebody said I missed something. He didn't tell you have two and three jobs. He didn't tell you make more money. He gets right down to the issue of our conversation and our speech. He says, turn away from evil and do good. Work hard at living in peace and unity with others. There's not one among us today who doesn't want the life that we speak about. And so Peter says, I'm going to show you how. Fundamentally, I'm going to show you how you can improve your life. And if you listen to the word of God, and if you begin to put God's word in action, beginning with today and Monday and Tuesday, I assure you that for the next year, you will see your life transformed into something you could never imagine. I truly believe that with all my heart. So how can we improve the quality of our lives? How can you improve the quality of the lives of those people that are around you? Here are two things that I like to draw out from the scriptures that stood out for me in my study. And the first thing that I would like you to make note of is to, to think about what you say. To think about what you think about what you say. That is so foundational. Do you know that many people don't think about what they say? 
We just talk and we just talk. From the time we wake up, we're talking. Me and my wife has opposite problems, and I believe God did it so somebody would be listening to the other. My wife is a morning person. I don't do mornings, and she has not gotten the memo. <laughs> from time my wife, because when I go to sleep, I put all my problems aside. But from time my wife's, my wife's open, I know she's up. Because she's very respectful of me and my sleep. So she let me sleep. But she starts moving her leg to shake the bed. So when I open my eyes, I would say to her, are you up? Mm, no, you keep sleeping. I don't mean to disturb your sleep. Next thing you know, the light is on her phone. I say, what's going on now? I'm doing my devotion. So I say, well, she wants to talk to God. So I wait a few more minutes. Finally, my eyes pop open, and I look across at her. And the minute I give her the signal I'm up, I begin to get my honey to-do list. She says, um, don't forget, today I think we haven't paid the mortgage yet. You're going to remember to go pay the mortgage? Yes, uh, I'm going to do that. Uh, and then I was, I was dreaming, and I thought about my son in in Houston, I said, what about him? And she'll tell me something that concerns her. I said, okay, I'll attend to that too. By time, oh, I like, and so I get up, I go to the bathroom, and I go to brush my teeth, and she stands because we got double sink. How do you know that's the, the benefit of a double sink? Your wife can get right next to you and keep talking. <laughs> I told you she's not a bad woman. But mornings is her thing. She gets up and she engages God and she engages her husband because we are the answer to her prayers. <laughs> Can someone give the Lord a hand? But now at night, I want to do talking and she likes to go to bed early. I have never seen two different people. <clears throat> she loved going to bed early. I'm like, but why do you want to go to bed? We just reach home. Let's talk. Oh, no, no, no. We're going to do that in the morning. She puts on her Vicks and she goes straight to sleep. <laughs> So what I'm telling you, from time we wake up to time we sleep, we're doing what? Say with me, talking. And Peter's teaching us a very valuable lesson, and we're not paying attention. But he says, if you want to win at life, if you want to improve your standard of listening, listen to the preacher, because the minister was wise. He taught the people wisdom. And he said, one of the first and most significant ways to improve the quality of your life is to watch or think about what you say. Because if you want a happy life, if you want to see good days and say, that's me, that's me. He says you're going to keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. That's what the man saying. And so I began to, to examine, I began to study, how can this revolutionize our lives? Just for information, it says that we spend 20% of our living days speaking. Write that down. One-fifth of your life is spent doing what? Speaking. <clears throat> and Jesus is saying that we have to be like him. So if you are reading Peter 3, and I, it almost confused me when I did it. I did it last night as I was continuing to work on it. I got this morning, and my first panic was, as I began to do it again, say, wait, I preached this already. And then... I went back to Peter 1 because I have all my texts from the other scriptures. I said, but it was in Peter 1. And if you go back to Peter 1, verses 22 and 20, 24, you're going you're gonna to see that it seems like Peter is repeating himself. How many of you had that deja vu? Like, I heard this already, right? And when you look at 1 Peter 2, a 1, verses 13 and 14, he talks about it. In 1 Peter 2, 24 and 20, 22 to 24, he talks about it again. He talks about not committing sin and not telling lies. He talks about our Lord Jesus Christ who committed no sin. He had no deceit. was found in his mouth. And when he was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten. Say with me, no evil. No evil. Say with me, no deceit. No. Say with me, no insults. Say with me, no threats. Amen. Now let me see the hands of those who have been able to live without doing any one of those. Okay, I'm speaking to the right crowd. Not even my wife was able to lift her hand, and she's close to perfect. If you notice, I wasn't able to lift my hands either, because I'm a very passionate person. How many of you can tell that I'm a passionate person? Yes, I'm a very passionate person, and living with me is difficult. 
So don't look up here and say, oh, that preacher is so nice. No, don't get deceived. I wouldn't deceive you like that. And we see that Jesus Christ committed no evil. There was no deceit, no insults, no threats. But yet he's a man who, who, who had a lot of opposition and who experienced personal difficulty, yet he didn't allow it to define him. He was defined by how he responded. And he actually taught us that the principle for his life, the principle that governed his life, that helped him as he went through life, was found in Matthew 12 and 36. If you could turn there with me. He says that every idle word, every idle word men speak, they must give an account for on the day of judgment. Wow. Say with me, wow, wow. Somebody actually did it. They say, uh, we, we speak about six chapters. If you were to write our words down, each day we create six chapters of words by speaking. They said by the end of the year, we would have created a library of novels by how much we speak. And Jesus is saying that you're going to give an account for every idle word. You start thinking about that. That's a monumental task. And so he says... Be careful because you will have to give an account to whom? Say with me, who? God. Not to the person you hurt, not to your spouse, not to your pastor. You will give an account for every idle word that you speak on the day of judgment. You must account for your words. Take responsibility for your words. Someone once know that all human conflict that disturbs our peace of mind begins with words. All human conflict that begins in the earth and disturbs our peace of mind begins with words. It is what is causing problems at work, causing problems in our marriage, causing problems with our siblings and parents and with our children. It's causing problems among friends and even at the church. Listen to a wise king who once lived. God said he was or the scriptures report that he was the wisest man who ever lived. Turn with me to Proverbs 18 and 21. He says, the town has the power of life and death in it. What is in the town? Life and death. What is in the town? Simultaneously, at the same time, it has both life and death. And those who use it will eat its fruit. What does he mean by that? He's actually saying that you will harvest you will harvest the result of your own words. Who harvests the results of their words? You. Who harvests the results of their words? You. Yes, your words can cause damage. Yes, your words can hurt. But the person who harvests the fruit of their words is you and I. Let me show you how this is supported by scriptures. Proverbs 11.9 in the NIV says, With their mouths, the godless destroy their neighbors. And you may ask, who is my neighbor? Everyone that God commands you to love. God says that when you are godless, when you don't pay attention to your words, when you don't care what comes out of your mouth, and it is sad, so many of God's children, people who say, I'm a child of God, I'm a man of God, we don't care what comes out of our mouth. And God is saying that the words of the godless destroy their neighbors. Wow. But if you think that is bad, he continues in Proverbs 11 and 11. He says, by the mouth of the wicked, a city, a whole city is destroyed. Do you begin to see like words are like a wildfire? It starts with our neighbors and then it goes to a city. He's saying with our words we are destroying where we live. And you know what is sad about these United States Virgin Islands? I'm sending them on Facebook. Some of you are going to like me. We are destroying these United States Virgin Islands in which we live. We like to speak bad of these Virgin Islands. We like to talk about, oh, this place is so bad. It's so full of crime and this and this. And we like to broadcast all of our shame. I grew up in a family, and I think my uncle and them is the last living who do that. If anything happened among them as brothers, you will never hear about it. Not from my father, not... I would probably have to stumble on it, and when I go and I say, hey, what about this? They say, oh, we don't air our, and, and I'm a relative, we don't air our dirty laundry. 
So they're telling me even as their nephew, who's now 52 years old, it's none of your concern. But we live in a day and age when people will badmouth their neighbor and we talk down these United States Virgin Islands. Yet we like to play the song, the VI nice, the VI nice. Well, if the VI is nice, talk like it. When your friends and relatives call you from overseas, talk up the United States Virgin Islands. How many of you love being here? Give the Lord a hand. I love the Virgin Islands. I'm going nowhere. Nothing ain't chased me from here, not even COVID. All my didn't marry, nothing ain't changed me from the Virgin Islands. But you say, you know what, I have an obligation here because God called me to the United States Virgin Islands. So you should pass the car. You really can't leave. But I also want to say you should love and pray for the city where you live. You can build up a place by your words, but he says you can also destroy it. How? By your words. Are you seeing that with me? Now, he continues, because I came today to teach you because this is so important. A lot of us don't pay attention to our words. And so many times we come into counseling and we're griping about what the other person is doing and how they ain't listening to you and they don't look at you and da da da. And you don't realize you are reaping the harvest of your words. And if I can get you to change your words, I can get you to improve your standard of living. Are you hearing me? So could we go to Proverbs 11:19? The person who enjoys the harvest of words is the one who speaks them. Do you get that? In Proverbs chapter 11, verses 17, NIV, and I'm going to show you because I'm going to insert words in here. He says, when we are kind, and now I insert with our words. Do you see what I just did? Are you following me? Okay, Proverbs 11, 17. I want to make sure because I'm teaching you. So when we are kind, and I'm inserting with our words, what does the scripture say? We benefit whom? Ourselves. We do what? We benefit whom? Okay, so when we are kind with our words, we benefit ourselves. I don't want to help me preach. Look up at me. Who do we benefit? Isn't that amazing? So when we are good with our words, we benefit ourselves. Here's another scripture. A man who desires friends must first show himself friendly. Isn't it amazing that there are people walking around, oh, people don't like me. This person don't like me. Well, could you just change your attitude and go out and show that you're a likable person? Could you just change? And instead of expecting people to like you, could you go out and just start liking people? And if you start liking people, the Bible says that you will begin to see that return to you. But here is something that I want you to also note. So you're ready for the other part of the verse. When we are cruel... And I insert, with our words, we bring ruin on ourselves. How many of you see? Just wave at me. I want to make sure I'm still preaching. Everybody see that? Well, good. I'm in the right place. And so the scriptures is clear that the person who enjoys the harvest of words and why we have to be careful about our words is the one who speaks them. All throughout the scripture, God warns and instructs us to think about what you say. Turn with me to Proverbs 13 and 3. He says, he who guards his lips guards his life. But he who speaks hastily or rashly, he comes to ruin. He who speaks before thinking comes to ruin. He who gets angry and speaks comes to ruin. In fact, it's when you are provoked and when you are angry is when you should be silent. In another place, King Solomon also says, there is one who speaks rashly like the trust of the sword. He's quick to jab you with his words. And we say that in colloquial way of speaking. But jab him good. Get him good. But the tongue of the wise brings healing. Say, that's me. You, oh, you couldn't say. <laughs> that's me. Glory to God. A little child shall lead him. Let's give the hands for the child who could say, that's me. I guess the rest of you are under conviction. <laughs> I am messing with you. Don't get vexed. But he's saying that if we are rash and we use our words to jab like a sword, he says, it's not good. But if you're wise, your words will bring healing. So if you love life and you want to see good days, think about what you say. Keep your lips from evil and your tongue from speaking guile. Weigh the consequences of your speech. And one of the quickest ways to do this 
is to keep your tongue from speaking to begin with. Isaiah prophesied about Jesus. Remember we talked about Jesus who told us for every idle word, you will give an account for it on the day of judgment. Jesus gives us another principle to the prophet Isaiah. Could you turn with me to Isaiah 53 and 7, New Living Translation. We live in a culture we don't like for the next person to get the last word. In fact, that is what makes some of our homes so contentious. Before you could finish your sentence, the person doesn't got a response for you. Who live in a house with, don't raise your hand because the person's going to get mad. Don't you do that. You almost feel like you're playing a ping pong game. Before you could finish a sentence, I'm not going to bow, pow. Sometimes you got to slow them down. I was just trying to explain because they have a response for everything. They are so argumentative. You know why they're that way? Because society teaches us that if we don't speak, we are losing. And the Bible teaches different, and that's why I'm talking to you today. The Bible is teaching you that he who keeps his tongue is winning. He who, who learns to discipline himself during hardships and during hostile conversation in, in environments is winning. And so Isaiah 53, 7 says that when he was oppressed and treated harshly, Yet he never, say with me what? He never said a word. In, in fact, he was upsetting Pontius Pilate with this because Pontius Pilate said, are you the king of the Jews? He wouldn't answer him. And he was upsetting them because it was like, are you not going to answer me? I have the power. You remember when Jesus said him straight, I have the power to set you free. You're not going to raise an argument. So Corelicia, he said, you don't have no power me, brothers. Let's just straighten the record. I can stay silent because I have entrusted my case to God. And if God wants me to walk out of here, I will walk. And many of you have to learn that, that just because you kept silent while the other person is speaking doesn't mean you're losing. Can someone give the Lord a hand? Because many of you have been argumentative because you think you're losing. I've come today to tell you that you're winning. In fact, if you want to annoy people who start to argue with you, but some of you don't speak in tongues, you just need to go in your heavenly language. Hey, glory. Oh. That annoys them. What are you saying now? Who are you talking to? Boy, if you want to get the devil mad, just go in the spirit. Oh, glory. And all of a sudden, the eyes will pop open. What still? Just open your Bible, start reading Psalm 91. He who abides in the shadow of the Almighty, I will say of the Lord. That would bring silence in the house. But this was a strategy of the Lord Jesus Christ. If I take off my suit, don't laugh at my 1960s shirt with the big colors, but my wife wanted me to match her. Poor wife. Even though he was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. Are you getting this? Who never said a word? Say with me, Jesus. Jesus. He never said a word. Did you see when the scriptures say, even though he was re um, retaliated, he never retaliated, even when he was assaulted, offended, he never. And this is why, because he never said a word. He was like a sheep that is silent before his shares. He's about to be taken advantage of. He did not open his mouth. And you know why Jesus did that? You want me to tell you why Jesus did that? Because he understood Proverbs 10 and 19. Could you turn with me to Proverbs 10 and 19? He says, when words are many. So with me, when words are what? Many. When words are what? Wise and women. Are you listening to me? When words are what? Woo! I even tell you what the next part say, but I want you to say with me, when words are? Everybody got that? Underline many. When words are many, sin is not absent. So don't get all righteous while you're talking, telling the other person how holier than thou you are and how sinful they are, because with your abundance of words, you are sinning. But he who holds his tongue is wise. You know, the old saints, and my aunt is here, she's 80 years old, give her a hand. <laughs> the only thing I thought this rule applied to women, and so sometimes, because she lived with me, 
with Reva when I was young. She would come into the room and tell me, shut no grace. We're not arguing back. But I thought the rule applied back in Sinkits to women. So I said, but you're using it wrong. You should be telling Reva about shut no grace. But she will tell me about shut no grace. And because she's my aunt now, I can't take my aggression and misplace it against this frail woman standing my way like a raging bull. Shut no grace. Shut my grace. Can you help me preach? Just lift your hand. Because I want you to practice. Say, shut my grace. That's what Jesus had. If you didn't hear it before, you weren't from Sinkins. Shut my grace. That's what the old saints called it. Proverbs 17, 28. English Standard Version. He says, when you keep your town, that's in Peter, and he says, and you closes your lips, you are deemed intelligent. Woo, I like that. Mm. Mm, I like the sound of that. He says, when you close your lips, mm, you should just hold your head like one of those nobles. Mm. You are deemed intelligent. How many of you like the sound of that? Can you men stand up and practice with me? Just start looking intelligent. Stand up. Don't leave me out here by myself. We're going to practice looking intelligent. Where's the camera? Catch the good side. Intelligent. Give the men a hand. And that's what God is calling us to. He says because when you hold your tongue, your wife who's looking at you is going to deem you intelligent. See that? That son of a gun ain't left me bait him today. That minister helped him a lot. But you know that I had him rooting in his anger, but he learned. He learned something on that Sunday. Should I take the christening on another day? I take him to church the wrong day. The man is a fox in me. He's deemed intelligent by even the person who's arguing with you and fussing with you. They look at you and say, there is a wise man. There is a wise woman. They are intelligent. Isn't it amazing that God says, when you shut your lips, you are winning? You are preventing sin from occurring, and you are pleasing your Heavenly Father. But yet, in our culture, we are taught the opposite. And we are making it hard for believers because, especially in evangelical circles, we think the more you talk, the more you're winning. That's why I am so hurt. And I hear and I'm saying nothing after November the 3rd, but I've had a lot to say about who was going to be the next president of the United States. You know, about how God tell him. And they are silent. Because you should only say what God tells you to say. And the church say what? Amen. Amen. And that's for everything. But even when they want to do the other way. And I come today to tell you that God is neither Democrat nor Republican. God is holy. <laughs> what God is? What God is? He neither care about your parties today nor yesterday. And if I had changed the names, he still don't care because God is holy. And he requires us to be what? That's what he wants. So when I come preaching to you today, I am talking to you about what being what? Yes. And one of the ways to be holy is to watch what comes out of your mouth. Man, you are a good church. So here are the principles of good communications. Are you ready? I'm going to give you the scriptures for it. James 1:19. He says, talk less, listen more. Write that down. Talk less, listen more. He said you should listen more than you speak. I can practice that, and I've tried. I've read that scripture so many times, but I'm a talker. I express myself through talking. And when my wife said, listen to me, it takes a lot of grace for me to mm, just keep quiet. I'm glad preaching is uh, just a one-way conversation. I will die if you had to inject something and say, but Pastor, I like that point. Can I? I like, oh no, I'm preaching. Couldn't. Let me finish. James 1 19, you got that? When you got that, say amen. Okay, Proverbs 21 and 23. He says, practice godless silence. What kind of silence? Godless silence. And he says, you must practice godless silence because it's a strategy for two things. Are you ready? It's a strategy to remove yourself from conflict. And to control your speech. Did you get that? God is saying, I want you to use godless silence 
because you're doing it unto God, you're not doing it and getting mad on mad on inside. He said you're doing it because you have wisdom and you're doing it unto God to remove yourself from conflict and to control your speech. Because you understand like nobody else that for every idle word that comes out of your mouth, even if it's right, because I'm angry and I'm right, I will answer to God on the day of judgment. You got that down? Now, here's the third point, because at some point you have to speak. Say, at some point I have to speak. At some point. So I'm about now to let you speak, but even when we do speak, he tells us how our speech should be used. And it's found in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 15 and 29. Let me know when I'm out of time, saints, so I can release God's people. I don't want to be unkind, but... I want you to get this. Ephesians 4.15 and 29. In Ephesians 4.15, it says this. Speak the truth how? How many of you are reading that? Speak the truth how? Speak the truth in love. How much you tell the truth? In love. And in our culture, once it's true, we don't care. Breaks off. But you know the truth. And God is saying, no, that's not how you use truth. You don't use truth like a sword. You don't use truth to tear people down. Speak the truth in Love. And do you know that some of us just have weaknesses because God created us that way? It has nothing to do with bad parenting. My mom, bless her heart, trained me well. She trained me that anybody I married would have stayed with me for 10 lifetimes. She was that good. Because she only had four sons, she had no daughters. And my mother meant we were not going to warehouse. So she taught us how to cook. James, you had similar situation, right? He only had brothers too and a mother. So she taught me how to cook. And the one thing I can remember saying as I'm getting ready to go to Uva at the age of 16, son, you got to know how not to bond the corned beef and how to cook the white rice. <laughs> that has been my strategy. If my wife don't cook, no argument. She see me go for that can of Libby's corned beef. I keep it in the shelf. It doesn't get touched until she don't cook. Libby's corned beef. Well, I don't eat it no more. So now I'm really humble because she had me just eating fish. Carl, you need to get off the meat. No, I have no defense. And right, but the other thing she taught me was how to take care of my clothes. She would say, when I get home from school, Carl, hang up your clothes. You know. So I tell you, all of us have faults because God created us way. But then I got married and I had this idea about a wife in my head. How many of you had an idea of a wife in your head before you got married? Nobody told you about a wife. I just had this idea of a wife in my head. And I don't know where I got it from. I don't know if it was from Hollywood. But I think a wife used to cook and do everything for you. When you see you were six, you were running with the Vicks and just rub your dung and, and sit on the edge of your bed like how mom used to do and hold your hand. And I didn't expect my wife to tell me, oh, you're such a big baby. And go, go in the closet, get your own tile now. I didn't expect that. That's rough treatment. I had a, diff a whole different concept. <laughs> and... When it comes to my clothes, I expected people to pick up after me. Who has the idea about a wife? I'm telling you, this is the way God created me. So I will take off my pants even at 52. I just made, but, um, well, I'm making body choosing. And I will lay the pants over the chair. And when she was raised, she asked this question. She went in the room, she said, why is the pants there? I'm like, good question. <laughs> I'm wondering why the pants are still there. But she's asking me. She mean put away your own pants. Then she wanted to stop abusing me. Your mother ain't raised you better than that. Yes, she did. But I expected my wife. What I'm trying to tell you. To pick up after me, right? Regardless of how you teach. And so I always have our flaws and shortcomings. I'm really using that as humor to tell you. Some... Sometimes things are not going to change regardless of how much you argue and fuss about it, but we have to be good. And just because something is true, what you don't expect for her to do, and she's never done this, but to walk in the room and say, man, I'm tired of you, you're nasty, man. Stop it. Cut it out. I shouldn't be walking behind no grown man picking up your drawers. I don't expect her to say that. You understand what I'm saying? Because even if it's true, say true, true, God says we have to speak the truth how? In love. So you know how I expect to be told to put my pants on a hanger? Yes, sweetie. 
babes. Because when she wants something, she uses all those nice babes. I expect to be used the same language, right? In love. Yeah, don't, don't fuss at me. I'm a grown man. Just, babes. You think you put your hand? I would so love and appreciate you if you just put your pants on the hand. Yes, dear. You see how easy that was? Give the Lord a hand. That was easy. I tell you, if you listen to me, it's going to change your life. Your house and your job will never be the same. And then we go to verse, which one I tell you, 29? Which one I tell you? You got to be listening, because I'm trying to close. 29, NIV. So he first, in 15, he says, speak the truth in love. Then he goes on to 29, and he gives us more conversation. He says, when you do speak, I want you to do something. Thank you, Brother Dick. And what is he saying in 29? Someone help me. Let no corrupt talk. Let no bad language. Let no bad words come out of what? Your mouth. I don't care how mad you are, you don't have permission to sin. He says, be angry and sin not. Even in your anger, it's not justification for hurting people. Because you have to always speak the truth in love and let no corrupting come out of your mouth. He's talking to believers. And then he went on to say what you should do when you continue to speak. Do what? But only that which does what? Edifies or build the person you're speaking to up. So God says when you do open your mouth, make sure you're speaking the truth in love. You're not using bad language. Everybody gets that? And what you say builds the person you're speaking to up. Give the Lord a hand. Builds them up. Well, boy, I preach so good, I tell you. So the second point was, after he's corrected your language, he says, now practice good behavior. So it means what? Good behavior. That's my last point. We're going to go home. Because this is the shortest point. Because if you fix your language, your behavior will follow. Are you hearing me? If you fix your language, your behavior will follow. And one of the things God keeps speaking about is good behavior. You know, as Christians, we have learned to define Christ Christianity by what we don't do. And a lot of it has nothing to do with Christianity. I don't smoke. I don't chew. I don't hang out with girls who do. That's how we define Christians. <laughs> you never heard that? Let say the Baptists used to say that. That's how you. So we have used about we have used make Christianity about what we don't do, and a lot of it has nothing to do about what you do. He said, turn from evil and do good. We talk about what we don't do. Somebody comes up to me and says, Pastor Carl, can Christians dance? And I will answer them. I say, I know some who can. I can't. <laughs> but it has to do with ability. If I get happy, I will dance. I have danced in my bathroom. I've danced in my bedroom. I dance in my living room. I don't go jam, but I dance. I dance when I'm happy. I dance when I'm excited. I dance when I think about family. I dance at Christmas and at celebrations. Because when I get happy, I move my feet. But I'm clumsy and I trip over my feet. So can Christians dance? The answer is probably yes. But I can't. And we have made Christianity about all those minor stuff because they're easy to get an A in. It's like the kid who comes home and tells you to fail at everything else he says, but dad, don't be disappointed. I'm passing PE. <laughs> That's what we have made Christianity. Don't worry, God. I'm not loving my neighbor. I'm not forgiving other people, but at least I don't smoke, I don't drink, and I don't dance. Oh, glory to God. And God is saying you got to do better than that. Help me preach. Tell your neighbor, do better than that. Do better than that. And he says, just don't talk about those things. He said, what I really want you to do is turn from evil and do good. Are you hearing me? Where did he get this from? Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 1, verses 16 to 17 in the NIV. When you just say Amen. He says, wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. 
Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless and plead the cause of the widow. Do good. And he tells us in concrete ways how we can make a difference in the world, improve the standard of living around you, and experience a good life. He encourages us to make a daily priority of doing good. Glory to God. Doing good. So we go back to Peter as I close. And how are the ways that he's taught us to do good? He's told us to pursue peace. Say with me, what peace? Paul has as much as lives in you, because I know some people push your buttons, live peaceably with all men. He tells us we should have sympathy. What is sympathy? When I feel in my heart the pain that you are going through in life, that is sympathy. He's saying care enough that you can feel the agony and pain of what people are experiencing in their lives. Say with me, sympathy. Sympathy. He says truly love. Do what? Truly love. Don't pretend. You know, I used to go to a church and a lady tell me, Oh, bro, we're going to fake it till we make it. I don't want no fake love. I want real love. Isn't it sad that we can pretend with a big smile to be hugging you in church, but as soon as you get to them doors, we're ducking you. It's a shame. Say with me, shame, shame. And one of the things we do in this church, we love you a lot. I'm sorry for coronavirus because we're going to spend 10 minutes hugging you today. Can live in hope, clap and say amen. We do that, we do that. We love on you like nobody business. But it's because God tells us we're supposed to love that way. And then he said, forgive. Say with me, what? Forgive. He said, if any man has offended you, do what? Forgive. If anybody has hurt you and marginalized you, do what? Forgive. That is Christianity. Forgive, love, have sympathy, show compassion. That's what doing good means. And all of those things impact our relationships. What do they do? Impact our relationships. If you will take the time... Good, very good. If you will take the time and go to First Peter 3, it has so many bullet points of what we can do to do good. And then he says that when you really live your faith, when you have good behavior, when you are loving and forgiving, when you are showing sympathy and compassionate, he says the world will stand up and pay notice. And even when men lie about you, that's what slander means. Even when they talk negative about you and about what you're doing for God, he says their very lies will speak against them. Their very lies will speak against them. And that's what God came to do. He wants to change that in your life and in my life. I pray today that the peace of God that passes all human understanding will guard your heart and mind. That it will flood your homes and flood your heart. So many people are disturbed in this moment. But God came that you can have peace. And the way that peace begins is by having a relationship with his son Jesus Christ. Yeshua as Savior and Lord. Don't fool yourself. Being a Christian isn't just putting on a suit and tie or a nice frock that reaches below your knees and coming into a place like this and then leaving unchanged. That is not what makes you a Christian. To be a Christian is to really know that Jesus Christ is indeed your Lord and Savior. And that's why he came into the world and that's why we preach. We preach and teach you what we know because of the Lord Jesus Christ himself who came and lived his life and became an example for all men. He lived his life so that I will pay attention and you will pay attention and it will change our hearts. It will change our minds. And Jesus, I say to you, a relationship with Jesus makes all the difference in the world. I truly believe as I'm speaking here to, to, to you today and the anointing of God is upon me, that having Jesus invade your heart and mind will change your whole outlook. It will change your finances. Can someone who has, that has happened for, give the Lord a hand, it will begin to revolutionize your family and your relationship. Having a relationship with Jesus Christ does all that. It does all that. It does all that to the honor and glory of God the Father. And you said, but, but Pastor Carl, you've said nothing about this Jesus. How can I know Jesus? The Bible says if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth, you shall be saved. What is it that we believe about the Lord Jesus Christ that makes salvation a reality in our hearts and minds? The first thing that we know is that he was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. Did you hear that before? Do you believe that? Wave at me. He says, conceive of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. But not only that, when he was born, he was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. The Lord Jesus lived a sinless life. He lived a sinless life. But here's the most remarkable part about the gospel story, that this Jesus, God the Son, in flesh, incarnate, went to the cross. He humbled himself to the will of the Father. And even after he prayed, not my will, but your will be done, he humbled and submitted himself even to the cross, and he died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. 
and to purchase a place for us in heaven. And the scriptures tell us that he rose again and he now sits at the right hand of God, making intercession for the saints and for every person who desires to know God. Right now, Jesus is praying for you so that you can have a relationship with God. And before I close, I would just like to humbly ask you, if you don't have that assurance, that confidence, that if you was to leave this space, you was to leave this auditorium, and if something was to happen to you, unfortunately, that you die, that you will not spend eternity with God, and you would like to have your name written down in the Lamb's Book of Life, you would like to make the record show certain. Even if you may have thought about it, you say, but I want to be sure today when I leave this place that I know this Jesus that Pastor Carl speaks about. I believe that it can happen for you based on what I've just shared with you. If you're sitting in this room under the sound of my voice, wherever you are, as this service is being streamed live, and God has spoken to your heart about your need to have a relationship with God, to Jesus Christ, His Son, could you just stand up wherever you are, in your bedrooms, in your living rooms, in this auditorium. If you like Jesus to become your personal Lord and Savior, I would like to pray with you. Before I pray for any other need, this is the most important need in this room is to have a relationship with Jesus God's son is there one is there one is there one hallelujah could you help me pray is there one you don't have to leave this place the way you came you can know the Bible says these things are written so that you can know that your names are written down in the Lamb's book of life you can know with certainty that you are born again that you are son and daughter of God we give God praise we give God praise I give you a few more minutes a few more minutes Glory to God. Glory to God. And now I'd like to pray for those who would like to see the Word of God revolutionize your life. He said, Pastor Carl, you know, I laugh at you and I had a good time with you. But I really need for the Holy Spirit of God to show up and do what you can't do. I want the Spirit of God to follow me home, follow me on my job, follow me into my personal life and begin to revolutionize and transform my life and bring about what you preach today. To make that a reality in my heart, and in my life and in my home. I want to see the power of God like never before. And I like to see his word bear fruit, even after today. If that is you, wherever you are under the sound of my voice, could you stand? I want to pray with you. I want to pray with you that the, the word of God will take effect, effect in your life, in your heart. Hallelujah, it begins to change you and transform you. Could you give them a hand as they stand? Oh, we give you praise. We thank you for your word, Father God. Yes, yeah, Psalms 138, you have elevated your word above all else. <laughs> You've elevated your word above all else. That's what you've done. And if we remind you of your word, you would respond. We are standing, Father God, and, and our standing is a, a demonstration of our faith. There's so much that concerns us, so much that is happening in our lives and in our times that is outside the realm of our control. And we've come today to just yield surrender. We are given up. We have done everything in our power to make our lives work. We have used so many words trying to fix us, trying to fix our situation. But we've only made a mess of it and made it worse. But today we've seen your strategy. We've heard your words. We receive your instructions. And Father God, as humbling as it is, like Peter who knew better, who knew how to fish, but he says, nevertheless at your word, woo, nevertheless at your word, I'm going to go out and do what you say. I've done what I thought was to the best of my understanding, but when I leave this place, I'm going to do what you say. I'm going to appear like a fool before men so that I can obtain and achieve the righteousness of God in my life and in my relationships. I want to see the power of God in my marriage. You are the God when you move in. You cause dead things to come to life again. You cause dead things to come to, I don't know why I'm repeating it, to life again. I feel the power of God. You cause dead things to come to life again. Can someone give the Lord a hand? You cause dead things to come to life again by the power of the living God. Hey, yes, I'm speaking to a situation in Jesus' mighty name. Yes, and you sent your word and you heal. You said healing comes at your word. We are praying for miracles, signs, and wonders. Hallelujah. In the lives of your people. 
all those who stand I pray for miracles upon miracles manifestation upon manifestation may you overtake them on their way home glory to God hallelujah and in the end Father God may they receive the reward for placing their confidence and trust in you may you bless and establish the works of their hands and fill their lives with unspeakable peace and may the joy of the Lord be their strength I'll be their portion in the name of your son Jesus Christ we pray let healing flow like a mighty river to all those who hear your voice and do your will. In the name of your son Jesus we pray. Yeshua the Christ and all God's people say Amen, Amen. Amen. Could you give a hand, the Lord a hand for his word? And now I release you. Lift your hands to heaven. I release you. Glory to God. Hey, there's an anointing upon my life. I release you. I pronounce God's favor on you. Hey, yes. I pray that the light of God will shine on your countenance. Yes, may he go before you. Hey, may he divide every spirit of confusion and make a way where there seems to be no way. May he cause light to illuminate your darkness. Hallelujah. May he speak his abiding peace and cause dry places to flow again with living water. Hallelujah. We speak to every seed in the ground and we command it to come forth and to bear fruit in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people say, Amen. I release you with the favor of God upon your life. Hallelujah. Go forth and prosper and live in peace. Hallelujah. God love you and I love you. Yes, continue to serve him with all your might. Have a wonderful day. Your friend